you knew you were going to get into business before you got into the Marine Corps, or did you develop your business sense whenever you were in the Marines? You know, it, it happened after I was in the Marine Corps. And um, uh, what, 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 what happened, Pat, is when I, was a, when I was a young kid, I grew up with nothing. Okay. I was, Love that. I was terrible in school, failed the fifth grade even. I'm not sure if it's right or if it's wrong. But what I do know is that it's different than what everyone else is doing. And I'm a fan of, of doing something different, especially when, when we have established players in the industry that have been around for decades. You got to make yourself stand out. You got to make yourself different if you're going to try to succeed. I worked at a steel mill for a year as a laborer down at Sparrows Point, Maryland. <laughs> and then at the University of Baltimore, I had this special deal for veterans. And I, so I, I took them up on it, went to college, graduated magna cum laude. Folks, the golf landscape in terms of golf clubs and everything else for that matter is changing every second. I can't comprehend all of it. So I'm bringing on Jared Dorfler of The Perfect Putt for the Dorfler effect. <laughs> What's up, Pants? Good to see you again. I think this is our third time. So let's keep it rolling. You know, it's awesome. I'm doing my own thing and I, I'll see one of your tweets come out and I'll be like, this guy has some extra knowledge. He's been doing some research and he's been putting facts together. So why not leverage off his knowledge? And recently it was about Bob Parsons and PXG. You guys are taking over, man. Not an easy, not an easy business to crack either. Uh, it's right? a tough business to crack. This is the toughest business I've ever been in. Mm. But see, I got an edge. And what my edge is, I love it. And what stuck out to me is you said, they're zagging while everyone else is zigging. Yeah, it, it is super interesting. And, and here's what I mean by that. Generally, the large OEMs in the golf space are going to sell through retail. 70 to 80% of their sales come through that channel. And recently, we've seen some direct-to-consumer brands pop up, mainly leveraging the online channel. But what PXG is doing is they're doing that, and they're also doing brick and mortar. So they have over 20 brick and mortar locations throughout the country, which is absolutely fascinating to me. Yam Enterprises is the- Yam Worldwide. Yeah, yeah. Yam, Yam Worldwide. Worldwide. And then you got PXG in there. <clears throat> we have motorcycle dealerships. I have a big hedge fund, shopping malls, metal finishing. It's particularly interesting considering he comes out in 2013 with his brand. It's, to me, almost a forbidden fruit. You've priced it way out of my league, but then you have certain people who want people to know that they paid three grand or more for their irons. So now you see on Instagram all the time, the direct to consumer, basically strategy, Hey, you can get this PXG iron for 80 bucks an iron now, but more importantly, you can get it fitted. So now they're tackling both the, the, the former market, but you can also get now they're in the, in the, in the market with sub 70 and the, all these other irons. And they're basically doing some type of hybrid stat strategy, right? Mm -hmm. How do you think this affects the, the brand overall? Because now you don't necessarily know, did you get the premium PXGs or did you get the $80 version? It's a really good question and it's a really good thought process because I don't know if we actually know the answer to that, but and I'll give you a, an analogy because I'm a little, I have a little recency bias because I'm reading the, the Elon Musk book right now by Walter Isaacson. And, and at the beginning of Tesla, you know, they had to start with a very expensive car due to the R and D and then over time they were going to lower the cost. And I'm not sure exactly if that's what Mr. Parsons and PXG did, but that's what they, what it appears they did do. And so they started with a, with a very expensive set of clubs around $5,000 for your bag. People wanted to know that, that you played PXG if you had them. Wanted to know, you know, it made you look like you had some money. And over time, the prices have come down significantly. Now, what PXG has said, the reason for that is because the, mainly R&D and scale. You know, they were beginning with, with selling thousands of clubs per year. Now they're selling millions per year, able to, to bring material costs down, labor costs down, everything else in scale and provide a better price to the consumer. Whether or not that that is what happened or if that's true, I mean, we won't know unless we're probably Mr. Parsons himself. But it kind of feels to me like it's a little bit like, like what Tesla did. Now, Tesla is introducing cars that are extremely affordable to what they were when they, when they started. So again, whether that's the path that they intended to follow or not, that's what it kind of seems like, like to me. That is a better analysis than I thought you'd come up with. I can't believe you're actually reading a Walter Isaacson book. Very impressive. It actually, when you explain it that way, it totally makes sense. You put out all these expenditures in the beginning, but to me also, he had that little bit of a eccentric air because he has the military background. I discovered the opposite sex and booze. There you go. Right. right. Yeah, it doesn't really make for good grades. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> so um, I uh, joined the Marine Corps with two buddies. This is in 1968. They obviously have the unique 
numbering system. And 0311 is, is a nod to the Marine Corps because that's their job code for a combat rifleman, which is what I was in Vietnam. Hell yeah! And he also came out and said that he pretty much didn't care if he made a profit. Now it seems it seems like they're switching over into serious business mode. Let's make money. And they've seen the whole landscape and said, hey, there's option A and there's option B. We, why don't we do both? Right. And, and I think there are very few people on this earth that know if PXG is profitable or not. Like, I have no idea if they're, they're profitable. You know, like, I'm sure there's people at the company that know if they, they are or aren't. But that's that's one of the, the benefits of being a private company. You know, it's your pirate ship and, and you can kind of roll with it the way you want. What's particularly fascinating about this conversation that has a certain organic genius occurring at every second is that you just brought up Elon Musk. Twitter, also a private company, has just had its valuation drop by 70 percent by fidelity. Do we really know what's going on? No, we, we, we don't know what's going on in private companies. And again, that's the that's the allure to them at some point, right? I mean, of course, there's insiders that have some information, but we'll never know the full picture as if you were a public company. Now, here's another interesting tweet you put out in terms of golf's popularity. All the golf industry experts are saying golf's never been more booming. Everything's fantastic right now. You see all these numbers, and I saw you put it on a tweet too. I'll put that tweet right up here right now. Bloop. It's on the screen. How is it that Nike, one of the leading sportswear and and equipment manufacturers, at least they were for golf, how are they pulling out of the golf apparel at a time when everyone seems to want to encourage everyone to go in? Yeah, not not really my area of expertise in apparel, but this is what I'll kind of lend it to is that Nike is a uh, is just a juggernaut with with apparel in, in sport. They've been around forever. Phil Knight, Shoe Dog, great book as well. This is what I'll kind of lend it to: is if you're going to go buy a bike, if you if you're really getting into cycling, are you going to go to Walmart to buy the bike? Or are you going to go to your local bike shop and get fit, get great measurements, etc.? Sure, you can go buy something at at Walmart, but they may not be the experts in the bike space. If you go to your local bike shop, they may be the experts. They likely are the experts. So. What I mean by that with Nike is that they have such a large portfolio. Were they really spending their time there like a Holderness and Bourne, like a Grayson? Although Grayson's sort of coming more to more places outside of golf. But are they spending enough time there? Are they focused enough there to make it work? I, I don't know. Obviously, it didn't work for equipment for them. How many books do you read a year, by the way? Because you're, you're dropping a lot of book knowledge right now. Not, not enough. Oh. I mean, I probably read maybe one book a month. I've read less than eight books in the last 10 years. Mm. I just want to throw that out there. I think I'm the, and that's probably still double the amount of the average American, but let's continue with this. <laughs> you have stats here where it says, as you brought up earlier, bicycling, 43.5 million. And it says here, golf is one of the most popular recreational sports in America. We come to on course golf, 25.7 million people. In America, a population 350, 370 million, depending on, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the border on that any given day. And then you have at the bottom saltwater fishing, which is at 14.3 million. I don't know if I trust these numbers because, hey, bowling is at 42.3 million. You're going to tell me one out of every nine Americans bowls? Sure. I mean, it was, it was a, a, a bit of a surprise for bowling when I read that. Now, that came from... That came from Recreate, which is a report that they ran. They came out with it this summer. Bowling, I thought, was sort of a, a dying sport. What they categorized is it go, you go bowling once a year, and does that mean that you're an active member, et cetera? Saltwater fishing doesn't necessarily surprise me. There's a lot of people that, that, that fish off the coast, and especially if you go down to Florida or down in the Carolinas. So, I mean, the off-course golf, on-course golf, we kind of know those numbers. NGF does a great job putting out that that report um, on an annual basis and they, they've got a pretty good method of doing so. So, yeah, I mean, it was, it's pretty cool to see that golf is so popular from a recreational standpoint, yet we, we can't even crack a top 100 event on TV from a rating standpoint. Now, in terms of a, a rating standpoint, it's hard to get people to watch golf, even if you're a golfer nowadays, because of the commercials, all these types of things. How does this relate? How does the lack of popularity on TV even though it's a sport, it's like, it seems like there's a, a lost opportunity to advertise because the advertising isn't appreciated and it's actually turning people off of the actual sport. Yeah. So your question is, how do we get these recreational golfers to watch golf? And, 
And honestly, I have no idea. And I think CBS and NBC are trying to figure that out too. The, the consumer is really turned off right now with watching golf on TV. Um, and there's, there's several reasons for that, in my opinion. Golf is slow. It takes a long time to, to watch. And I mean, the Masters obviously does an exceptional job with reduced commercials. It's gorgeous to watch. There's usually really good storylines. And that gets anywhere from 12 to 15 million a year on a Sunday. That's not even really close. I mean, it's not, it didn't even crack the top 100. So th there certainly is something there. Now there's a large base. If you're a marketing person, you say like, well, that's the top of my funnel, right? Is those people that play recreational golf. How do we bring those people down to, to watch golf? And that, that'll be a challenge. The Dorfler effect and I have strategy. Hit us up later in the comment section. We'll give you how to actually make people watch golf. But let's get back to Bob Parsons. Now, one of the reasons, you know, people maybe not be watching golf right now is because we have this huge divide in golf between the PG Tour and Liv. Bob Parsons has come out on record saying that he doesn't necessarily want his PXG brand associated with Liv because he's a patriot. So mm -hmm. he's got that out there about a year or so ago. But he's also becoming more of this guy who wants to make money. How does he somewhat walk back these comments now that it seems that Liv is here to stay? Mm, that's a really good question. And you know, it's my favorite topic, Pants, is the Live versus PGA Tour deal. I'm going to be happy one day when this is all done with. The, the, the thing is with Bob is that he's afforded to, to make comments that other companies aren't because he's got a private organization. You know, I'm sure that, and by the way, I, I think with, with Bob, and he's always said, he's, he's, he's never been afraid to speak his mind. I don't know if he needs to walk it back. I mean, it, the thing is, is what, what I feel in the live versus PGA tour thing is there's a lot of flip floppers and they go both ways. Uh, now, if you're Callaway or Taylor made or, or even, you know, Titleist, you can't come out and say that you, you really can't come out and, 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 and pledge, uh, you know, your, your loyalty for one or the other, because it's, it's such a divisive thing that it's going to, it's really going to kill you. And, you know, for, for Callaway and, and, and Title as both public companies, they, they can't risk that with shareholders. And TaylorMade, with, owned by a private equity company in, in Korea, they can't really risk it either because I imagine that they would like to go public at some point in the future. So, again, having a private company afforded Mr. Parsons and, and to do different things and say different things. Final question. You've nailed it all so far. <laughs> PXG has a very... You know, they obviously provide steep discounts to military members. Bob Parsons also, you know, referred to himself as a patriot. It's very military, potentially even first responder oriented. Mm -hmm. Some of these guys will also think, hey, you know, they're going to agree with Parsons' original statement saying, hey, I don't want to be associated with this because they, ha they associate, you know, negative things with Saudi Arabia. Do, does Bob Parsons and the PSG brand lose certain members who are loyal to that brand? because he's, you know, somewhat going to flip flop. I don't think so. And showed my teachers my orders and they all passed. And then we were at Paris Island in August, me and my buddies. And then we were carrying a rifle in Vietnam six months later. I don't think so. And, and Bob has been pretty outspoken about, I believe he was a Marine and I believe he got shot. I lasted a month. I lasted a month and I hit a tripwire while I was walking on the point team. And I think he's been pretty outspoken with with his support, with, with that core, that core audience, if you will. Everything I ever accomplished, I owe to the United States Marine Corps. I honestly don't think that this really, this really matters for, for him. He said and done things, in my opinion, that are more raunchy or a little bit maybe, I don't know whether you call it over the line or maybe people disagree with um, that, than this. And so I don't think it's a, it's a huge deal for him. I actually, I actually think it, it won't really be much of an issue for him at all. I think what they probably need to focus on is continu continuing their strategy from a direct consumer base and creating products that, that, want, that golfers want to hit. Folks, if you want the hot tip early, subscribe to Perfect Putt Newsletter. Jared, again, thank you for being on this episode of Big Boy Pants Golf. Look forward to having you again in the future. Right on, Pants. Thanks for having me.